Okay, it's 2.35 p.m. Eastern, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for this O&M contractor engagement session on water quality management in federally owned facilities. My name is Court Hatchell, and I'll be your host today. We have almost 200 participants from our operations and maintenance vendor community representing multiple regions, contracts, and buildings no two of which are exactly the same. Therefore, we set up today's event to help ensure that everyone is on the same page with our performance work statements and walks away from this session with a consistent understanding of pricing. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. First off, I'd like to inform you that we are recording today's session. If you do not wish to participate in this recorded session, now is your chance to bow out. A copy of the recording will be sent to all registrants so you will be able to watch the full session. I'd also like to mention that Zoom offers closed captioning services with this presentation. You can turn on captions by clicking the captions option on the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we have muted your audio to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. To that end, we encourage you to direct specific questions regarding contractual requirements to contracting officers as contractors must work with their respective contracting officer to ensure compliance. This is the first, but not the last time you will hear something along those lines today. All right, oh, skip ahead. Now for some introductions. So as I said before, my name is Court Hatchell and I am the Senior Advisor for the Public Building Service, Public Building Service Office of Facilities Management. As Senior Advisor, I am overseeing the execution of our water quality management initiative and testing effort. Prior to coming to central office, I spent the first 14 years of my GSA career in various facility management roles in region five and have had the pleasure of working with some of you on the call today. Next, I'd like to introduce Courtney Springer. Courtney is the assistant commissioner of PBS's office of facilities management. In this role, Courtney has oversight of the approximately 8,600 federally owned and leased facilities in the GSA portfolio. He's going to give the background of our water quality management effort and how we got to where we are today. And last on this slide, but first in terms of keeping GSA at the forefront of water quality, we have Brad Short. Brad is PBS's National Industrial Hygiene and Safety Program Manager. He is an accomplished professional with extensive experience in the environmental, health, and safety field. He spearheads strategic initiatives and coordinates nationwide programs aimed at enhancing standards and promoting EHS best practices across diverse program areas. Brad will be delving into the finer details of our performance work statements and addressing potential clarifications we've heard from the field. We have a tight agenda today, as you can see here. We'll start with the recent history of water quality management at PBS and then delve deeper into the performance work statements listed. At the end, I'll touch on some one-stop shop resources we've developed and close us out. And here's an important disclaimer here at the beginning, which I'm going to read to you verbatim. <clears throat> Not every scope of work or PWS listed in the agenda and discussed during the event may apply to your contract. Additionally, this event is for informational purposes only, and any statements made do not, do not constitute changes to contractual requirements or direction to contractors to perform or not perform any action. Specific questions regarding contractual requirements should be directed to contracting officers, as contractors must work with their respective contracting officer to ensure compliance. Okay. Now I'd like to turn the session over to our first presenter, Courtney Springer. Courtney, the floor is yours. Thanks, Court. Uh, I'm Courtney Springer, the Assistant Commissioner for Facilities. I wanna first uh, start off with thanking all of you for attending this session today. I know you've got busy schedules, you got a lot going on. Uh, we appreciate this. Um, we just want to make sure that we're providing you every bit of information we can about our scopes uh, and providing clarity about what we're looking to do here, uh, since this is new for everybody. Also, I'd like to thank you for all your support and operation of our over 1,600 buildings in the GSA. Um, 
uh, facilities listing. Uh, we count on you and you are our business partners. Our success relies on you um, supporting us and executing our contracts. Uh, so appreciate everything that you do for us. I also want to let you know the reason we're doing this and the reason we do many of the things at GSA is because the safety of our employees, your contractors, and our customers is of utmost importance. Uh, so we look at things like our water management quality uh, standards and we keep them updated. So today we'll focus on that a little bit. Our water quality standards started in 2016. Uh, many of you are aware of that. Uh, like many of our other standards, we put a uh, end date to them. So we have to focus on them, study them and renew them. And that's what we did last year with our water quality management program. As we were studying our water quality management program, we reached out to many different municipalities, many different regulators, EPA, OSHA. We reached out to the state of California to talk to them about what they were doing with water quality. Uh, we looked at many different articles, periodicals, um, trade journals, uh, worked with ASHRAE. One thing we noted that stuck out as particular importance to us was some CDC facts on Legionnaire's disease. We noted since 2000 that there was a pretty significant uptick in cases, a nine-fold increase between the year 2000 and 2018. We noticed that that most significant increase was after the year 2017. And while that decreased a little bit during the time of COVID, as individuals started reporting back to the uh, buildings, we started to see a little bit more of an uptick just in the general population. So we also noted starting last July that we had several buildings and several incidents pop up in the GSA inventory. Uh, we had a total of 24 instances that we were working in our facilities uh, between the time when we started reviewing our policies and when we issued our policies. That number was alarming to us. We noticed not, ish, not only issues with bacteria and Legionella, but also some concerns with heavy metals. So we decided to build a, a overall review and an overall look at our water quality management from both the owned and the leased facility, which would have a baseline testing of all facilities. And Brad will talk about that here in just a minute. So we took all these factors into consideration. At the same time we were issuing our policy, ASHRAE came out with some new and updated standards. Uh, so we adopted uh, many of those standards into our policy. And not only are we doing a baseline water testing of our facilities, but we're also doing a long-term water management and focused approach uh, to proactive management of our water quality on buildings that we're gonna refer to as focus buildings. As Court Hatchell mentioned when we start, no two of our buildings are exactly the same. Uh, not every building has exactly the same approach, um, but we're gonna go through all the cleanse and all the scope today um, with you on this call to make sure that we're covering this and making as much clarity as we can um, and, and answering as many questions as we can on the scope and interpretation of the scope. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brad, who's going to talk about uh, what we're testing and how we're doing it. Great. Thank you, Courtney. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining for today. We really do appreciate all the support your teams have been providing to advance our water quality initiatives nationwide. Today's session aims to delve into the finer details and address potential clarifications we've heard from the field. To kick things off, I want to emphasize that I cannot speak about any of your specific contracts and that all questions you might have should be directed to the GSA contracting officer. While the primary focus of our session this afternoon will be on the baseline water testing in CLIN 1, we will also offer additional insights into the various other water initiatives. These may or may not be applicable to your specific contract, but our goal is to provide comprehensive information to support your understanding of potential considerations and requirements. All right, let's delve into CLIN 1 to start us off for the afternoon which outlines the requirements for the baseline water testing. As per the PWS, the O&M contractor will need to furnish GSA with a comprehensive written report 
that includes testing results for the following contaminants, Legionella, total coliforms, including E. coli, lead, and copper. The first topic that is important to cover regarding the baseline testing is who exactly can perform the test. There are three main options and also an alternative in the event that none of the other options are feasible. To conduct the baseline water testing, individuals must meet one of the following criteria. Be a certified industrial hygienist, have an ASSE 1280 certification, and the third option is the on-site individual can be a health and safety professional supervised by a CIH or an ASSE 1280 certified individual with a minimum of two years of experience doing potable water sampling. In the majority of cases, companies will opt for this third option because they generally refrain from assigning their higher paid employees to solely collect water samples due to those cost considerations. Alternatively, and one that doesn't seem to be frequently used so far, is for cases where the above qualifications aren't readily available. Contractors may seek government approval through written request, and they can employ any environmental or industrial hygiene consultant with at least two years of experience in potable water sampling. An example of where this would be an appropriate solution is when a facility is located outside of a major metropolitan area and these highly qualified individuals are not readily available without costly travel. Please discuss this with your contracting officer if this is a case for your facility to ease the scheduling and administrative burdens that come with all this travel consideration, as well as avoid excessive financial implications. All right, let's transition to a topic that frequently necessitates clarification during proposal reviews, often due to overestimating the scope of work requirements. This pertains to the locations of where testing will take place. We'll begin by outlining the specific areas where Legionella-only samples are required, focusing on common source equipment and more specific special use spaces. So for the incoming potable water supply, We'll be looking at one sample per service line, hot water storage tanks, one sample per tank if a valve is available, expansion tanks, one sample per tank, again, if a valve is available, hot water recirculation circuits, one sample per plumbing riser if a valve is available, building common and tenant showers, one sample for every three fixtures if this is applicable to your facility, all point of use outlets that are primarily designed for human consumption in a child care center. Again, a lot of our facilities don't have child care centers. And finally, all point of use outlets that are primarily designed for human consumption or the treatment of patients in health units. Again, if applicable, not all of our facilities have health units. So drawing on in-depth discussions with on-site personnel, I'd like to address several common misunderstandings we aim to clarify here today. Throughout this presentation, I will reiterate that I cannot address individual contract specifics and any questions should be directed to the GSA contracting officer. But for facilities with childcare centers or healthcare units, this scope requires testing of all outlets that are primarily designed for human consumption or treatment of patients. This would only include things like drinking fountains, bottle fillers, kitchenettes, patient sinks, or break room faucets. However, it doesn't include restroom faucets, janitor sinks, mop sinks, hose bibs, or similar fixtures. This is one of the most important items to double check. A lot of times we've been seeing restroom fixtures that are upwards of a couple hundred fixtures in a facility. Please note, these are not included in the baseline sampling. For the shower requirements, these do not include the emergency showers or eye wash stations. And finally, it does not include common source equipment that do not have drain valves or another option to take a sample. If you cannot logistically pull a sample from those tanks or risers, it doesn't apply to the scope of work. Now that we've talked about the Legionella specific sampling locations, 
let's broaden our focus to talk about the water fixtures where all parameters will be tested. As a reminder, this would encompass Legionella, lead, copper, and total coliform, including E. coli. According to the PWS, this involves sampling 10% of water outlets throughout the building that are primarily designed for human consumption, such as drinking fountains, bottle fillers, and kitchenettes. In smaller facilities, where this calculates to less than five outlets, a minimum of five should be tested. While I cannot speak to individual contract details, here are some helpful clarifications to guide our understanding together. This should not include in your sampling plan restroom faucets, janitorial sinks, mop sinks, hose bibs, or similar fixtures. Similar to our discussion a minute ago, this is one of the most important items to double check. In a different vein, for Legionella sampling, samples are either taken from the cot or cold water, depending on the fixture, but both are not required. Another item that we've been working through with some of our sampling contractors is how to conduct first draw samples. So there are several strategies available to fulfill the first draw sampling requirements while meeting the scope of work. Our protocol does not mandate collecting samples on separate occasions, such as on different days. The first approach involves utilizing separate outlets for filling first draw bottles for metals and Legionella. For instance, Pairs of drinking fountains can serve this purpose, considering the sampling rate of only 10%. This ensures abundance of available options within a facility. Alternatively, when sampling for both metals and Legionella from the same tap, the recommended sequence is to collect metals first. If hot water is accessible, obtaining a Legionella sample from the hot water line is minimally affected by collecting a first draw sample for cold water for metals first. In cases where hot water is unavailable, a first draw metal sample should be collected first, followed promptly by the Legionella sample. We specifically specified a small volume sample to be collected for both parameters, taking all of this into consideration when we were developing the scope of work. This chart summarizes the references outlined in the scope of work which includes valuable insights from the CDC resources for Legionella alongside the EPA National Primary Drinking Water Regulations. This approach ensures alignment with industry best practices and regulatory standards. One of the critical aspects we need to address is the protocol for handling results that exceed the thresholds outlined in the previous slide. Firstly, if the sampling contractors are separate from the O&M contractor, they must immediately notify the O&M contractor upon detecting any exceedances. Subsequently, the O&M contractor is required to inform the GSA COR of any exceedances within 24 hours of receiving notification. Additionally, the O&M contractor must immediately remove the affected outlets from service and post signage as per the PWS. Please be aware that GSA has already developed standardized signage for usage, and this is not something that your teams need to go out and create. We have this available for your teams. It's also essential to note that any corrective actions not covered by the existing contract will be funded independently and should not be included in the initial cost proposal for CLIN 1. This ensures the necessary measures are promptly implemented while adhering to contractual agreements and financial considerations. All right, now let's transition to a different topic. It's important to remember that not all the items discussed may be included in your specific contract. So please take what applies to your situation and disregard the rest. With that being said, let's delve into the topic of preventative flushing. First, let's talk about common source locations, such as storage tanks and expansion tanks. Where possible, flush tank weekly over the course of four weeks at the drain valve until the volume of water is replaced and that water runs clean. Moving on to risers, 
flush each riser for 10 minutes weekly over the course of those four weeks and utilize a drain valve or other high volume outlets such as a janitor's closet as needed. Moving on to showers, in the first week, remove and disinfect and then reinstall or replace the shower heads. However, it's really important to consult with your contracting officer regarding any potential cost concerns associated with this work, especially if it involves extensive disassembly or could potentially damage those ornamental fixtures. While I cannot address the specifics of your individual contract, I want to convey that is not the intention of this effort to cause damage to equipment. Our goal is to implement measures that enhance water quality and safety in a fiscally responsible manner. Once completed, flush showers weekly over the course of the four weeks until that water temperature stabilizes. Please note that please note that temperature measures are not required for this effort. For those drinking water outlets, in the first week, we're gonna remove, disinfect, and reinstall or replace aerators. Again, it's important to consult with the contracting officer regarding any potential cost concerns associated with this work, especially if it involves extensive disassembly. And while I cannot speak to your individual contract, the intention was not, for example, to have to disassemble an entire water fountain that might have an internal aerator to meet these requirements. Those are types of scenarios that really should be uh, discussed with the contracting officer. So weekly for four weeks, we're gonna, re what, uh, we're gonna run those refrigerated water fountains for three minutes and bottle fillers for one minute. For other drinking water outlets, uh, open the cold and hot water for uh, each one of those outlets for one minute. And please note that the hot and cold water can be done at the same time and temperature measurements are not required. Also remember that this only applies to drinking fountains, bottle fillers, kitchenettes, and break room faucets. It does not include restroom faucets, janitors, sinks, mops, sinks, hose, bibs, or similar fixtures that we have touched on a few times during this presentation. All right, let's switch gears again. We're going to transition to CLINS 2 and 3. We'll delve into the PBS guidance to maintain or restore water quality. As a reminder, as it's been a little bit since we've all got together, this is the guidance that applies to facilities that are greater than 50,000 square feet with a booster pump or those over six stories. It's important to note that this guidance excludes other buildings that are of smaller size. Additionally, if the building already adheres to an ASHRAE 188 or 514 water management program for its potable water system, that plan supersedes the PBS guidance. Central to this guidance is the completion of the water sampling and flushing plan template that has been provided to each of your teams. Furthermore, the inclusion of the most recent consumer confidence report is part of this plan to verify the disinfectant that's used by the water provider and its intended concentration range when it gets to the building. This information can easily be found by visiting the water system's website or doing a sim simple Google search of drinking water quality report coupled with your city and state will typically get you the information that you need. The completed template should be submitted to the GSA contracting officer representative for approval within 30 days of implementing this guidance. Once again, while I cannot address specifics of your contract and all inquiries must be directed to the CO, I can offer some general insights that might help clarify certain matters. It's imperative to thoroughly examine your current contract, especially in light of COVID-related activities, anticipating some overlap between new requirements and existing O&M operations, GSA expects that the proposed modification costs should not duplicate these pre-existing obligations. To significantly reduce workload and for consistency, a plug and play water sampling and flushing plan template has been developed to aid the O&M vendor. This plan completion should not necessitate any subcontractor engagement. Any individuals familiar with the building's plumbing system can adequately complete it 
In the majority of cases, this can be completed within a few hours and the GSA property managers or the regional SMEs can certainly help your teams with this process as needed. Given that these plans should be crafted by individuals already familiar with the site's plumbing, additional site investigation should not be warranted. Once this plan has been developed regarding the execution of the plan, any trade within the O&M contractor familiar with the building's plumbing system can perform the required tasks and the requirements are expected to be met during normal working hours. For the monthly temperature and chlorine checks, no laboratory analysis is required. Handheld direct read instruments are all that are needed. Another important clarification is that the weekly flushing activities outlined in the plan for childcare centers, health units, and building common and tenant showers do not require any temperature or chlorine checks. Assessing temperature stability can be completed with your hand and both hot and cold water can be flushed at the same time. Additionally, it's important to note that flushing excludes emergency showers or eyewashes as activation and documentation of this work should already occur weekly. For facilities not falling within the size criteria of the PBS guidance to restore or maintain qual water quality, yet still housing amenities such as childcare centers, health units, or building or common tenant showers, you might have got a different CLIN. And it's important that we dispel some similar common misconception as we did on the previous slide. And this really closely aligns with the last slide. But again, I cannot contract or I cannot comment on your specific contract requirements, but merely these are general observations that we've seen. So the weekly flushing does not require any temperature or chlorine checks. Temperature stability can be verified by simply putting your hand under the water. Both hot and cold water can be flushed at the same time. Tasks are expected to be carried out during normal working hours and can be performed by any trade within the O&M contract who has received training on the scope. These tasks involve turning on water fixtures, making it unnecessary to engage third party or testing vendors for this work. And then weekly flushing protocols do not include emergency showers or eyewashes as activation and documentation of this work should already occur weekly. All right, as we approach the end of this presentation, I really do appreciate your continued attention. I know this is a lot of information. So finally, let's delve into CLIN 5, which pertains to the routine Legionella testing of cooling towers, humidifiers, misters, and decorative fountains. While specific inquiries requiring your contract should be directed to your CO, here are some noteworthy best practices we've observed. Monthly testing of cooling towers within this PBS aims to replace the existing quarterly Legionella testing requirement found in current contracts. It's crucial to ensure proper crediting of any testing already mandated under your current contract when transitioning to a monthly schedule. Utilizing the subcontractor already tasked with regular on-site maintenance of the cooling tower for the monthly Legionella testing is not only practical, but also efficient. The key requirement is that the contractor has experience with this type of activity, which directly aligns with what these current companies already specialize in. The only requirement for a deliverable is the actual lab reports. There's no comprehensive written report akin to the baseline water testing. And these requirements should be fulfilled during standard working hours. At this point, I want to say thanks again for all your hard work, and I will now pass it back to Courtney to wrap us up for the afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Brad, for such an informative presentation. Before we conclude, I wanted to briefly point out a couple of resources that we've developed around the water quality management effort that are available to you. GSA's water quality website and fact sheet are great one-stop shops for an overview of, our, of the water quality management program, as well as a trove of additional water quality and safety resources provided by our partner agencies, such as CDC, EPA, OSHA, and ASHRAE. 
that concludes uh, the presentation today. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Brad. And a big thanks to all of you, our vendors and partners, for your continued efforts in supporting such a critical effort to ensure the health and safety of our federal buildings and customers. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.